I just want to want to, I thought there was already a question, you're giving directions, that's good. Um, I want to go over a little bit of my motivation for why I'm here. Um, okay. Um, I was working in the emergency room, as some of you, some of you know, uh, beginning in 2005, and, and once the um, ER was converted to an urgent care, which didn't please me, as it didn't please many of the people in the community, um, I became less and less enchanted with my job and had the very tough decision of what to do. But by resigning in December, I w it freed me up to work uh, for this community in other ways. And uh, so I joined the Wellness Foundation and um, as of Jan January have worked uh, on a committee looking into what's next for this community. I, among others, feel that it's just a matter of time before we are going to be scrambling looking for clinicians that are going to be delivering health care on this peninsula. Um, I don't know that for certain, but when you look at the trend that everything's gone upstream to Damariscotta, to Brunswick, and to Maine Medical Center, uh, less and less do we have facilities for our care and evaluation here. But also less and less do we have the power, political power and voice that we once had uh, when we had our own community hospital. And I think that's a tragedy. I think it's um, medical decision making going in the wrong direction. So um, perhaps I'm too idealistic, but I would hope that by um, this town, community, the various communities here working together, coming up with uh, collaborative ideas about how we should carry out clinical care in this community. Then we can come up with some alternate um, solutions. If each community did the same, I think you would see that power base, that power shifting away from the big uh, conglomerates, if you will, of medical hospitals, of drug companies, of government, all making decisions that they think are ideal for the patient, but in fact don't necessarily reflect what our needs are. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, the, the next thing that, that caught my eye was, um, Patty had mentioned uh, E. Dave, um, e-patient Dave who spoke to us in July and he gave a very powerful talk about his own involvement in his health care and what it meant for him to face a very serious medical problem and to um, thanks this is good I can't quite see this to see face a very serious medical problem and not really know where to turn and he obviously was connected to a very good physician who is enlightened, but Dave found his way through a maze of information on the internet and he came up with some very critical decision on his own that he strongly believes uh, saved his, uh, his own life. Um, that's a pretty dramatic example, but I think in many small ways we each could duplicate that when we're faced with questions. So that's the thrust of tonight's uh, talk. Where this comes together, I think, is the word synergy. The more we know about our own health care, the better, about our own health records, that is, the better health care we can get. The more knowledgeable we are and the more involved in our own clinical decisions, the better off we are. And if we think about that magnified throughout the community and all of the brain power that we've got here and the willingness to work, I think we can generate something that's going to be a very good knowledge base and also that's going to prepare us for what comes next in terms of what do we want for a clinical facility. Okay, I trust you all have this um, handout, how to become an empowered patient in the, in the um, outline form. Um, this, my experience with Patty over the past few days is a classic example why we can't depend on electronics and somebody else to do the right thing for us. 
we downloaded a, uh, we both have Apple uh, computers and are somewhat facile at, at this, Patty much more than I. But when we talked about generating slides for this meeting, we um, found a program called Keynote. The problem is that none of the Apple devices that I have will talk to each other by virtue of a new program um, and waiting for another new program and none of them talk together. And such is the basis really of our electronic medical records throughout the country right now. So what is an empowered patient and why is it important? Um, I'm going to read from uh, Dave DeBroncart's book, Let Patients Help. It's a small book, but it's very powerful in the messages. And um, he describes uh, two terms the, to think about. One is empowered. Do we have that? Good. An empowered person knows what she wants. Um, I would hope that um, this is gender indifferent, but um, <laughs> we will find out. A disempowered person faced with a challenge will say there's nothing I can do about it. That's the hallmark of being powerless. Facing the same challenge, an empowered person thinks, what can I do, no matter what the odds? To be engaged is to be involved, active, and responding. An engaged patient listens, responds, asks questions, thinks for him or herself, and acts. A disengaged patient threatens health care, treats health care like a car wash, rolls up the window, sits back, sits back and gets things sprayed on him. <laughs> so I think those are clever ways to define it. And, but, but obviously, the message is we need to get involved. And I think nobody's exempt from this. I think we should all do it and to some degree for people that are sight or hearing impaired or not great with computers or have a real disdain for them, hopefully by the development of this self-empowerment program, we will develop people that can assist other people in the community who are not as inclined to dig up the information by themselves. So what, what I thought was that this is all consistent with the goals of the Wellness Foundation as stated in the mission, the vision, and the values. The, um, what, I, what I plan, or what I think is good for us at this point, um, and this is really only a developing point because I want a lot of input, not only tonight, but ongoing. And I'm sure Patty would welcome that as well. Um, there are already has been a series of lectures. I think we can find additional people to lecture and hopefully some of these will be focused on what you in the community want. So that hopefully the feedback that we get through tonight, through the study groups, will provide us some real insight into what really matters. Um, there are really good courses out there. Some of the hospitals provide excellent patient teaching when it comes to diabetes and nutrition and things like that. It doesn't mean we can't add to it, but I think rather than replicating their, their lectures or teaching programs, we'd simply make, uh, look at the best programs available and on our website list them so you can access them. Um, I would include study groups that I'll talk about later tonight, um, website references that we'll post on, the, on the, our web. Um, and certainly library materials, I understand. We are going to have a shelf devoted to medical books, most of which I'm, I'm going to do donate most of mine, <clears throat> which currently sit on my floor and, uh, and literally collect dust and really are a sight. So we're looking at the future of medical care in this community and we're saying what do we really need and obviously the first thing we need is knowledge and we're going to need this in an ongoing fashion. We're not sure how to go about this. This is a new adventure for us. This is a new venture for me. Um, none of us has ever really worked together in a study group. So I'm going to do what I think is um, best for a while, but the idea as we develop this study group, again, I'm going to describe this in detail later, that we're going to invite input from every participant and try to develop 
um, better curricula and streamline the way that we all learn. So owning your medical and health records, why is, why is this important? Well, there's a number of reasons, but I just want to underline, I think it could be incredibly simple. Once you start, it becomes easier. The, the simple approach to keeping your own medical record, and I mean actually something that you can lay your hands on at home, it, it's, it's best to be simple. I think anyone can do this. Perhaps you need some help, and all you really need is self-motivation. Uh, but the key, too, is collaboration. I brought two examples of things you could use. Um, I went to Staples recently. This is the type of three ribbon binder that we'll use in the study groups and simply have dividers. I also have some um, plastic covers for those things that I don't want to spill coffee on. And there is a smaller version which is more portable, but for the group, I, because I tend to expand and write big, I'd just as soon use this. But either one of these would be appropriate. And um, I think if you keep Keep this file up to date and, and uh, always near you and take it with you when you're seeing your doctor or getting a consultation or going to a hospital. It would be in your best interest. So at this point, I want to take a break and see if there are any comments to see if you think this is a, a worthwhile process. Yes? Mm. How do you think they would respond if we have a whole notebook? Um, I would hope they would respond favorably. And I think that's a real cue to what sort of relationship you have with a physician, be it your primary care or any physician. If you're getting blatant, blatant disregard, I would really consider talking to the person about this because this is very important. And I think you'll, it'll become apparent as I talk a little bit more. I'll, kind of give you some reasons why I think that. I think it's an excellent question, but I would just say, just be brazen. Don't, don't worry about how it's going to be received. You just have to say, this is important to me. I can do that. Right. <laughs> Th that said, I think that one thing I think that's really important, the message that, that e-patient Dave gave us, and the thing I'd like to repeat over again, this is not to replace your doctor. And it's not to be in competition with any healthcare provider. It's really meant to be collaborative. But it's also important for you to learn not only how to keep your own records, but something of your own health issues. It will get easier as time goes on. And I think there'll be a culture change where physicians, nurse practitioners, probably the most receptive would be the nurse practitioners. It's just their nature, I think. But, you know, I think no matter where you go, you should take this booklet with you because there are going to be people that um, have misinformation. So it also allows you to, to put your notes directly in it. You could have a section, for instance, just, just for taking notes. Yes? In what form are these past records available? Let me, let me get back to that in a little bit. That's going to be in my next session, so make sure I answer your question then, okay? Yes. I'm sorry. Hi, June. Yes. Yeah, uh, how far back do you suggest we hang on to these? I have them 10 years back. Uh, you know, that's, that's a really important question, and there's no easy answer to it. It depends on how significant your medical problems were early in life. And so the longer you live, there may be something in, in your medical past that's very important. For instance, um, as many of you know, I worked as a surgeon for quite a while. Um, I did some general surgery as well as vascular, and, and just a simple case of, does somebody have appendicitis? Well, somebody has belly pain, that's always on the radar screen. But um, so many people didn't know if they still had their appendix, and yet they had scars there. You know, they, and, and it's understandable. I mean, there's a lot of things that people took for granted in the past, 
But this is an invitation to think about things like this. There, there might be a, real, a time in your life, you know, later life, where this information becomes very important. And it could save a test, too. For instance, um, you all know CAT scans are readily available. They're horribly expensive. There is some risk to it. And if I were a surgeon looking at you and you had pain where the appendix is, and yet I knew there wasn't appendicitis because you had your appendix out, I might say, okay, we can forgo a CT tonight. Let's watch how things are going. Maybe it's something like diverticulitis. You might want to treat with antibiotics and just wait and see. So really, the more you can retrieve, the better off you are. Now, if you're in your 90s, you live through a period where records were very sparse. Gets back to your, your, some of your question, the implication of your question. And retrieving them is going to be very difficult. So you have to do the best you can, but, but I think be as inclusive as, as you possibly could be. So any other questions about patient empowerment, whether any ideas about how we could improve on this? I will say that I think, getting back to your question, I think that a lot of physicians who really are caring people actually will welcome this. They may, they may shrug it off as a, a bit of a nuisance effect. Just realize, time-wise, they are really pushed to the maximum when they're in an office. They may have 10 minutes, 15 minutes at best, and they've got to pull together a lot of information, make a lot of decisions, re review a lot of information, and, and answer your questions. And unfortunately, the, the last part, the questions answered, that gets short shrifted. So I think a lot of people feel bad about that, but they don't have a ready solution. There isn't a lot of time, extra time. So anyway, um, so now I'm going on to, to section five about medical records. Just a few comments to give you some perspective. Um, old medical records, and I've been in practice and training long enough to see these change immensely. Um, I started medical school in 1975, and at that point, most medical records, most, the biggest medical records were obviously in hospitals. Most of them were paper. Um, they were, they got to be very voluminous. Um, if a patient stayed for a long time in the hospital, they often got broken down into second, third charts hidden away in some drawer. So what was, you know, current on the chart had to do with the you know, the last two weeks, if somebody had been in there for 90 days, it was a struggle to find them. Um, and as you can imagine, lots of information got lost and it wasn't archived well, and it wasn't really transmissible. So for the amount of impact of the, of the records, they were really relatively costly. Not to add the, the illegibility of most physicians is notorious, and it really, and, and, it, and it just was, it's always been true, and it always will be true, I suppose. So it was really good that we started shifting over to medical records, and of course a lot of, there was a transition where things were dictated and typed for us. It took a long time. Sometimes the, the dictations got lost. Other times, medical records would be, after a few years, would go on to microfiche, I think it's called, and those records would be transported to some other planet and take about three months to retrieve. <laughs> you could always predict how long a patient was going to stay. It was uh, inversely proportional to the length of time it would get the medical records. So electronic records, uh, by coming about, I think, have been much more efficient. Um, they're very easily transmitted. Um, they're much more legible and they can be generated faster. Um, it's easier now with computers to organize them and an obvious advantage is that clinicians can now program these uh, records to actually get meaningful data out. If meaningful data is kept and properly um, are archived in a record, then it can be retrieved for study. Um, this is being mandated increasingly by the federal government, the, um, the Medicare people, and they're looking at how does a primary physician deal with diabetes? How effective is that physician with treating diabetes? Hypertension, there are a number of benchmarks that can now be looked at 
And so this is, it, the electronic records are really a good thing. But sometimes those mandates drive physicians in areas that they would rather not spend time. Sometimes those mandates take up too much time for their benefit. And there are physicians who would rather focus on the individual questions that arise in their practice. And at the very least, spend time with their patients as opposed to doing uh, scut work for the government. Does everybody know what scut work is? Okay. That was our, that was our biggest gripe when I was a resident. The, the main thing to remember is electronic medical records, as neat as they are, as official as they are, even though they're powerful, they don't guarantee accuracy. Um, I worked um, in this emergency room and other emergency rooms with a system called T-Charts. And the one, the rendition that we used at St. Andrews was an electronic medical record, but it was, a, it was based on templates. So if a patient came in with belly pain, that was the picture you got. You went down this algorithm. It's like going through a maze where the door is chosen for you. You can back out of it, you can redo it, but it had a little bit of mind control and people tend to click boxes too quickly. They may not be accurate. They may not truly reflect what was going on. And I missed the days where you could actually pick up a dictaphone and, and put into it what you were thinking and why. Because the next person coming along who's puzzling over this person's problem, the same problem that hasn't gone away, can reflect on what I said and maybe make some headway. Um, it also, I think, is safer uh, because you can be more specific about instructions and things like that. So electronic medical records, as good as they are, sometimes they short changes in ways that you might not anticipate. One of the important things to remember, too, is with our mobile society, you know, you're going to be here, Ira, for how much longer? A week. A week, okay. So then you're going to go to South Carolina, right? Okay. So do you know if all your medical records are equal in both places? Do you know if they're all as equally accessible? I think it depends on how far back we're talking. So what if you then went from South Carolina to Texas or Florida wow. or flew across the pond? What I'm getting at is we don't always have access to our medical records. So the more you know, the more you can remember, great, but Obviously, we can all find ourselves in situations where we may not be alert enough to tell somebody. We may have had a seizure or, or a stroke. Um, our spouse, partner, child, or parent may or not be with us. And so transmission of this information is really important. And one of the goals, one of the ideal goals of the new electronic medical records will be to have a patient's medical record with everything in it that's important, is way back as important, and easily accessible. And I think we're a long way from that, and there's a lot of hurdles to get over. And, and that's one of the biggest things. That used to bother me a lot, because people would come in who were local at night, when I first started, and say, well, it's in the, it's in the records. Well, where the hell are the records, you know? I don't know where they are, you know? So if you... If you compound that by being a, um, sometimes a, an emergency physician is doing uh, a moonlighting job in the ER and doesn't know the system, that's going to delay things. So the point is, obviously, the quicker you can access the really pertinent information, the better off you are. So how do you obtain and how do you maintain your own personal records? Um, I think this is, again, this is the example that I think of the difficulty is if you have moved multiple times and you haven't kept track of the hospitals where you had care or the physicians that rendered care, it's going to be difficult. So one of the things that I've suggested later on, and I'll reinforce this, is that when you've had a medical encounter, put it on a chronological sheet. 
you know, October 7th, 2014, went to the podiatrist for ingrown toenail. Sounds minor, but maybe some of these things will add up. Um, the really important visits have to be, and I, I would include things like operations. You're having a hot flash, Peggy? Oh. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yes? Is, is there a method um, to uh, go through the internet to do this, or is that a confidentiality situation if you have all your records? In other words, how would you obtain them? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, yeah, I think it's going to change over time. There may be ways to facilitate this, but right now you have to fill out a form that, that um, we used to use a standardized form and we would have the hospital number on it and so forth. I would fill in my name. We would have the patient's name, date of birth, and what we're looking for. It might be really simple. I don't want all the records if all I'm looking for is a cardiogram. Let's say somebody comes in with chest pain and we don't have any cardiograms in our computer or on our records. And I don't know whether subtle changes I'm seeing are, are new and significant or whether they've always been there. And that really is key for the next few minutes, what I do, and how intensely I watch that patient. So um, in that case, I would simply say I want an EKG, and I'd make sure the secretary emphasized that, not only in writing, but we're sending you a message. We want the EKG as soon as possible. So, but, I'm, oh, I'll be with you in just a second. If you're looking for say all your medical records from your doctor's office when you lived say in another state two years ago you still would have to fill that out you would probably f help yourself by calling them and saying this is what my doctor wants if they're saying well you've got to fill out a form then they would do that if you had the type of relationship with your with your doctor before who still remembers you you could say, well, my doctor up here in Maine needs my records as soon as possible. Do I have to jump through hoops, or can you help me out here? And I think most people are willing to really bend the rules. Bef Judy, there's a gentleman back there, and then I'll ask. Well, just to share uh, real life experience, I, I think that what we find, I have, in fact, uh, gone to various providers over the last five years and requested my medical records. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but where I actually had to go, in per go there in person and identify myself, sign legal forms before they would release anything to me, as opposed to a, a personal physician who was passive, who was more than happy uh, to give me access. But the problem was um, somebody had to make copies of a lot of paper. So I think at this point in time, going to require a lot of um, effort on the part of, of individuals, and there just is no easy way. You're absolutely right. Uh, obviously, the, the simpler the information you want, the briefer, the easier it's going to be. And, but that will be something that I hope to coach in this study group. But, but I'll also say this. You've, you've really provided me another reason why it's important for you to track what's been done. Okay, so you say, okay, I get home from Maine Med, and fortunately it didn't require a lot of narcotics. Your memory's fairly clear. You have a spouse who documents things, something like that. You can actually start writing down the, the simple kind of, uh, you know, what did I have? Well, I had colonoscopy, and I had general anesthesia, and I was there overnight. But put the dates and what you remember to the best of your knowledge. At least that's a starting point. Again, I, I would like to uh, support what you're saying because having had that very experience in mm -hmm. medical mm -hmm. um, and immediately requesting information to review whether it was accurate or not, mm -hmm. uh, because there was a potential for malpractice in that case, uh, we found that it was inaccurate. 
there were some things that were omitted from the record. It's, it's interesting because um, I want to make a comment that I think we should put this down as a thing to do. We need to find out for the community better ways to help people get their medical records. So if you would work with us in this and come up with suggestions, all of you think about this. This is a type of thing, type of thing where collaboration can really, so if we make something that's, I mean, any one person is gonna be kind of stiffed, obviously, or at times. I don't think everybody is, but, but I think that there, the more you join together and the stronger case you make for it, you can design a wellness foundation release of information form so we can download it, print it, and, um, and see what we can do. But there's, there's got to be ways that together we have more power with that. Um, did you have to get legal help to, to do that? I, I didn't, but, but again, to, again, to support you, there's a concept in quality control that you know, best practices. And, and, I, and I think what you're suggesting, if we can all come together and find what works mm -hmm. and document them as best practices, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that they don't necessarily, um, they're not stonewalling. It's just that they don't have the time, nor do they have the expertise. They're not very good at data handling. That's not their thing. At data handling? And data yes. handling. Yes, yeah, I and would agree with that. So to the extent that we can do some of that thinking for them and begin to present to that community kind of a standard mm -hmm. doing it that they see more and more and more, mm -hmm. I Yeah. Give us what we need with, uh, with not, without taxing their limited time. Right. You know, it, it, just an anecdotal experience. The other thing that we found working in the ER is um, I'd be listening to the secretary sit right next to me and um, a very um, a good communicator. And um, she would get on the phone and talk to the person in the medical records. You could tell from her side of the conversation there was tremendous variation from individual to individual, how they were perceiving their, their restrictions. And not everybody has the same comfort level. Not everybody can think in real time and say, yeah, this is a real emergency. I've got to do this, you know. It, it, it's, a, it's tremendous. So human variation and human mistakes are, are a big thing. Yeah, uh, Judy. By the way, for you, the, does everybody know Judy Stone here? If you would, if not, introduce yourself. Judy Stone is a summertime neighbor of ours. It's her husband. She's a physician that works in infectious disease. So, uh, thank you. What, what I wanted to say, uh, while you're working on gathering your binders and getting information together, two immediate things that you could do that would be extraordinarily helpful or put a card in your wallet with what medications you take and put a card in your wallet not just with what medicines you think you are allergic to but what the reaction is exactly because very good that is a huge problem and, and one of the things i get many consults over are people who say they're allergic to everything when in fact they got a headache or they got an upset stomach there's a difference between intolerances and true drug reactions where you can't breathe or you've got hives. So please, that, that is something... Or something that's totally coincidental. Right, and yeah. that is something you can do... No, absolutely right true, away. absolutely true. Thank you, Ju Judy. <coughs> Steve, I think, um, at least in the beginning, uh, having this group uh, and be able to share experiences, because I think we're going to find different practices, different hospitals have different requirements not, I don't think, going to accept, at least for now, our standard request form or authorization. So, but we can learn together. Well, if you have to request records from this place, here's how, what you're going to have to, hoop you're going to have to jump through for them. And it's a different hoop for this person and save everybody doing all that research on their own. Now, we can shortcut it. I think that's, I think that's the, uh, an excellent suggestion, and as we go through and, and reprioritize what our next projects are, that would be really right at the, actually that has to come fairly soon because 
I think as we work as in the study group, we're going to find the commonality of those themes of resistance and problems. So we can start to put this together and, and maybe in three months or so, give another presentation where we can address some of the things that we've learned in the study group. But also, um, you know, I think that in some way we're going to have to appeal to, to either the state legislation, uh, medical societies, be they, you know, um, you know, a county medical society of the state to help us in this process. I mean, if they think that, that if, if the, the really recalcitrant ones think that they're going to block this trend, I think, you know, they're just nuts. I mean, this, this is a movement, I think, that's really good for everybody, and I think it's here to stay. Sir, yes. Hi. That's true, and, and by the way, in the, the canned speech that I handed you, in the back there is a reference site for the very first reference web. is really worthwhile seeing that addresses that issue, Sarah. It's, it's HIPAA and it's very well uh, written and it tells you what your rights are. Yes, Bill. That is correct. You know what would be really interesting, I was just thinking, is if I take your anecdotal story, anybody's, and we start adding it up, we're going to see common themes here, and it would be a really interesting to publish a little paper from this community. I think this puts the Wellness Foundation on the map, but it also, I think, is good because if you, whether you publish it in a newspaper or a magazine, I think it's, it's putting people in the medical establishment who necess aren't necessarily thinking the same way, way we are there's a movement that we really need to pay attention to. I think it's potentially very good. But, um, so that would be, I think, something I would love to, you know, maybe we should make some sort of effort to, in addition to what Jerry's saying, look at the hurdles p individual people have had and come up with solutions what would have made it better so we can sort of collate these. Yeah, Rick? I'm trying to wrap my, arm, my mind around this, Steve. Uh, healthcare setting that I worked in for many years, if a patient went into a, a pharmacy in Los Angeles, California, and it was within the same system, that patient showed up the next day in Philadelphia, whatever the pharmacist said in Los Angeles would be available to the pharmacist in Philadelphia. So I, I sort mm. of thought that if I was within X healthcare system, they could help. If I go to the hospital at Miles, that information is readily available to my primary care. Is that not true? No. <coughs> <laughs> so I, in order to get my medical records, I have to go to Miles and to the primary care that everybody doesn't see everything? I think there are two, uh, there are two <coughs> distinct questions implied. And, and the first one, um, it, you're talking about would the information that one pharmacist put in the, in the uh, computer be available to the pharmacist in Philadelphia? Well, yeah, and, and I would have to say that in a good electronic medical record, that should be true. Two downfalls for that. Individuals aren't always prompt when it comes to dealing with medical records. Um, physicians who are really busy don't always have the time to enter all the data they might want. We've got to make, there's got to be a system. That's one of the messages I wanted to bring tonight. We've, we've got to work with our health care providers to find ways that are better for them to facilitate what they do so they in turn can give us more of what we want, which is time and explanation. So if, if let's say Lincoln County Health, they're using Epic. I should be able, if I were working in the ER urgent care, I should be able to access that as long as it's current. Now. There are some things that are missing though. Like I would, somebody would come in who's 99 and on death's door step, and I'm, the logical question for me is how much should we do? Should we offer comfort care? 
uh, how do I address a, a family of strangers? They don't know me. Are they going to get the wrong impression? That was always the emotional battle I had of, of how to approach this. And so if I could go into Epic and I found that there was already a code status there, that is somebody says, come hell or high water, I'm not going to be resuscitated, then at the, uh, you know, I know what to do. And I can shift gears and go into helping that person feel comfortable, help their family deal with the situation. But if you get into one of these situations where nobody knows, then how much do you do? I mean, the, you know, it's like a New York City cab, the meter's running from the time the patient comes in and it's just going fast and fast and we're spending a lot of money and spinning our wheels. And so information has to be available to us. And that's a classic example. Sure. Or radiology. And, and nothing communicates with outpatient clinics. So they're all different systems. In some places, the lab is yet still on a different computer system. So do not rely on any communication even within a hospital or between them. So when you have a follow up from a hospital visit with your family care, mm -hmm. primary care physician, one should assume that that primary care physician doesn't necessarily know what happened in the hospital. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that an assumption or a presumption? I'm just asking. That's a joke. Never mind. I, <laughs> it's a long story. I won't go into it. Um, I think it's safe to say that you don't know. Um, the very least what you... Being the primary care. Hmm, that, that maybe there hasn't been time for that. Maybe that doctor was on vacation or nurse practitioner was on vacation. Um, and so this is the first day back and there's all this inf piles of information on the desk to read. It's a voluminous, you were in there for a sex change or whatever, how long it took, you know. So, so you know, it takes a long time in some cases. And, um, and sometimes there is so much data there, what you're really interested in may not have been digested. What I would suggest is this. When you're discharged from a hospital, you're given a packet of information. Read it over, study it. Make sure the medications are accurate. There are, there's this whole uh, initiative called medical medicine reconciliation, and it works wonders sometimes, and it can create great chaos other times. People, medicines are left off that should have been there, so the person thinks if it's not on the list, I shouldn't take it, that could be a mistake. Um, you might have the wrong dosage on there. So these, these are really important to check as you're being, uh, you know, discharged from the hospital. There should be a face-to-face -face meeting with at least one of the hospitalists or people that took care of you, rendered care when you were in the hospital. And the most important thing is your medication reconciliation. Then there are other things like, you know, what should I do for the wound if you had surgery? How active should I be? When can I drive? All of those things. But those aren't, they're not quite so critical. You can all err on the side of conservatism as far as activities until you really talk to somebody or use your own judgment. But um, I don't know if that, that's helpful, but I, I really think that, you know, we're, a, we're probably not at the stage where they're going to give you your whole medical record when you leave. Um, but that packet of information, they're trying to do a better job with the discharge planning to take into account things like, what do you need at home if you're an elder? What do you need for meals? What do you need for medications? Should the visiting nurse come in? All of these contingencies. And those should jibe with what's logical, what's possible, and with the people who help take care of you. Everybody kind of has to understand that whole process. Yes, Jerry? Yes. That's probably true. But I can tell you, let's look at it from another way. I'm glad you brought that up because it gave me, uh, I didn't mention this in here. 
what's important to Rick may not be what's in, it may not really be in the discharge summary. It's an overview. It's like reading the preface of a book. Um, let's say that you wanted to read, you're a very careful person, you're a pharmacist, you want to know what the medications were. So you'd like to maybe look at the whole med list that you got while you were there. Something's not right. And so there's some details in that med list, that administration list that you, when you were in, in the hospital, something may have been administered to you that's, that's not sitting right. And I doubt that that will appear in the discharge summary. That's not the type of detail that's going to appear. So, you know, it's an open-ended question, how much is enough? But I can tell, I can give you lots of anecdotal examples of things that would be very important for you to know. By the way, before I forget about it, if anybody has heart disease, I would strongly recommend you all carry with you a copy of your most recent cardiogram because that is one classic example. I partially alluded to it before, but people who have heart disease and you can say, well, my EKG was normal, but you don't really know that. What's normal to you, your doctor may have said, well, it looks normal, which means, you know, obviously your heart's not, you're not dying right this minute, but you know, there are some electrical changes that we can't really say are normal, yet you take it away that your cardiogram is normal. For the, for the emergency room physician you're seeing at that moment, maybe looking at it and saying, hmm, this is, this is really bitty, a little bit funny. So, you know, the devil's always in the details. Um, I think that the more information that you know about yourself, the more likely you are to ask the type of rhetorical questions that prepare you for wanting to know what's in those medical records, to wanting to know what you're going to ask your doctor, and what is going to be meaningful in the next year. So, any other questions at this point? Yes. This is kind of not a question, it's a positive thing. You know, I had a medical emergency and you were living in St. Andrews that I was sent over to Miles. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that my record followed me and then when I came back to see Dr. Barker, he knew all about it. Mm -hmm. So, it's possible. Yeah, it is. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and, and no question, that's the way it's intended. It really is. Ideally, I'll get you just a minute, but ideally what I think should happen, what I tried to do when I was in the emergency room, if there was something that was left up in the air, i.e. I wasn't quite sure of the diagnosis, I would pick up the phone and talk to the primary care physician and say, I saw Mrs. Davis today, I'm not quite sure what's going on. I'm kind of worried about this. I've asked her to make an appointment to see you next week. Please make sure it happens. And that alerts them to the fact that that person was there and, and I can speak to them and they can say, well, you know, she's here all the time with that complaint. We've looked into it, you know, a thousand times and she's just not content that it's, it's nothing. Or she, or, the doctor might say, gee, that's really important. I'm, she's never complained about that to me, so I'll definitely look into it. I think that's what has to happen. You can't just depend on the medical record speaking for the physician that completes it for you or for the doctor that's going to be receiving that medical record. You know, it's a little bit like having a movie without sound. You know, there's a lot of information there, but there's a lot that isn't, so, yes. Santa. Uh, um, I had uh, a, a visit yesterday with my primary physician, and he spent almost two hours with me, which I thought was unusual. So I, I'm wondering, is the trend changing with um, physicians? Because he never spent that much time, but he, he wanted to go over, because I have a condition, mm -hmm. and he wanted to go over a lot of things. Mm -hmm which he never did before. So I'm wondering, is the trend changing? No. Well, well let, me, let me answer. This, this there is the potential for that to change, yes. Some models of primary care are now looking at ways to shift the usual, 
kind of automatic, you don't need to be thinking too hard about this to go over patients, to glean information. Physician helpers, if you were, you know, uh, or people helping nurse practitioners. People that are trained in ga gaining information. A doctor doesn't have to gather the information about you necessarily, but needs to po pose the question, read it over, talk to you, mm -hmm. clarify things. So hopefully, I mean, that's one of the ideal changes that, we, that a lot of people in primary care would le like to see, that, that, that the reimbursement is done fairly enough so that a, so a physician's time is properly paid for and that it allows physicians to pick and choose those patients that need more time. Let's say a patient has five significant medical conditions and as Rick said, posed, comes out of the hospital. You need to balance all of those because one may affect the other, new medications, all of these things. Said that to me yeah. Yeah. Right. If the hospital doesn't allow me to, or well, doesn't allow me to do it, then it's <coughs> time for me to leave. I know. <laughs> it's. It, it's sad and you know it never used to be this way um, and there are a lot of reasons it's changed I think you can all uh, appreciate that but more than not, not physicians are putting a little time slot and they're they're dealing with widgets along the assembly line and I don't think patients like it I know physicians don't like it and it's just terrible for the most part yes I'm sorry, it didn't work in what? It didn't work in the healthcare industry. Oh, yeah. I, I remember you're making that comment uh, this July. And all the hospitals and, and large group practices were first getting into electronic and medical records. Well, like anything else, the problem is, is that they were sold to by very aggressive software firms. And even as Jane said, even within individual hospitals, the buyers were there. And the, the insurance industry made a very active uh, move to try to go to what they call the individual health record that would be kept on a card in a computer chip. And the technology existed then. The problem was that everyone had just spent many millions of dollars on different systems. And it became a financial decision that no one could agree on what the best system was to go to a universal system. Uh, there was also problems with socialized medicine and everything else. So right now here in you know, the 21st century, what we're talking about is getting paper records and putting them in a three ring binder is absolutely the only way that I know of that you can actually collate all that material in one place. Yeah, thanks for saying that but because... None of, none of the systems, uh, there's too many out there, they spend too much money on them, yeah. and there's no one individual system. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I hope that you would help participate in, in this group, the community, understanding that you have a lot of wealth of information to bring to the table, so thank you. design a paper format that would take care of all of this, mm -hmm. that you could actually carry around with you. A medical diary. A medical diary, if you will. There are many. Okay, don't steal my thunder, Just please. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we all get brilliant ideas. <laughs> So, so June, let me let me answer that. Say you ended up with three volumes. If you really put everything on paper, lab slips, x-rays, ultrasound, podiatrist visits, physical therapy, nurse's note, medication, yada, 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 yada. 
or as my granddaughter goes, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, what you can do is you can have a section of your chart that serves as a direction for where this person wants to go for the information. You don't have to have all your lab stored in your chart, but you could have trends. For instance, if anemia is a problem, you put that on a, what's called a problem list and you give a little synopsis of that. I have been anemic for 30 years. It's been investigated. No one knows why. It's never severe. End of story. My, or my hemoglobin averages around such and such. That's a little snapshot of that problem that conveys all the information I would need if I were first meeting you. So don't get blindsided by the volume of the information. What we need to do is think of ways to contract it to boil it down to the essence. What we have to do is figure out what really is the essence and what's the best format for that, how to best do it, have a standardized approach so people can readily learn this and keep, we, it, once we do this, we can keep perpetuating it for other people in the community that also want to learn. Yes, go ahead. It seems to me that in your study group, you ought to have um, access or a participation from the computer departments at the hospitals or the information gathering people at the hospitals to tell you what they need to be able to meet the kind of requests that you want to have. I think you're right and, and that would be part of my job or I could assign that to somebody else to go with me. We could go and ask medical, what they call health information departments for that for that uh, information. And, and think about it, it's kind of ironic they call it health information when they're really treating diseases. It's you know, your records want to convey something about your health. But, but that's what it's called. It's no longer called medical records. I, I like the idea, though. Yes, Jerry. Steve, to, I think to try and deal with June's problem, and I think everybody is going to have that problem to one degree or another. If we gather all of this data, that's not helpful. We, we're going to need <coughs> to learn to present that data in some meaningful way that conveys the necessary information. Absolutely. So like, mm -hmm. If you've got 20 years of tracking some lab value that's important, you don't want 20 years worth of lab results, maybe a graph or yeah. some sort of a trend that says, oh, okay, it's, it, it's abnormal, but it's been level for the last 10 years, probably. In fact, many of the labs will, will print out something. You have that availability. But even that is maybe too much detail, because there, there isn't a big different, you know, variation, you know. But you're, but you're right, yes? Uh, one thing that I want to be careful of, a lot of, uh, a lot of folks here seem to think that this is a good idea, and it is. But there's an old joke about how there are 14 competing standards. Someone says, okay, I'm going to make one that's the, that, that'll end this whole uh, disagreement. Then there are 15 to be <laughs> mm -hmm. So just, just be careful how far you want to take this, or else it, it'll, be, it'll be another system that nobody can agree on and is fighting for headspace with the other uh, systems. I think the point I want to get across this evening to everybody, and if I haven't said it, well, this, then I want to say it again. I, we're going to become empowered patients starting with the whole process of gaining understanding of your medical problems, gaining access to your medical records. And you don't have to be a librarian or a medical health information specialist, but you need to start somewhere. But this is a process of how you go about getting information it's a little bit like going to the gym. You're not going to get pumped up the first day. You're going to have to keep going back, and you're going to have to maintain it. And, and, but there is a logic to all of this. And I think that by cooperating, we can develop helpful hints and handbooks and things for people that are, want to stay invested in their health practice, in their health um, you know, medical problems, and work collaboratively with the physicians. They're going to be better off. But, you, but you're right, there is no, there's no one size fits all. If, 
if there were, there'd be one size that fits all, and there isn't, so. Any other questions right now? Um, so let's see, I've lost track of where I am. Seven. Am I down, well, are we down to seven? Okay, good. Um, oh, one thing I did want to mention, e, point E under six. Um, eventually, medical electronic systems are going to get better and better, and eventually some of these systems are going to have two parts. Hopefully one part that's for the patient at home, and one part that's for the office or the hospital or whatever. There, is, there was one site I investigated online um, called myrecords.com or something like that where you can pay a hundred bucks and you can subscribe to your medical records. Well, that should be for free. I think that's a proprietary thing and I would guess that that's probably not going to be a big player. Um, so when we get to the point where it makes sense to start investing in, in electronic medical records, then by having this habit of keeping your own on paper, you can start to develop your own electronic medical records, say. It doesn't necessarily keep us in the dark ages as far as technology goes. It's simply a starting place where we can all feel comfortable and we have fewer glitches, I think, at the outset. So that's, that's the message there. So, a couple of, couple of questions about um, where, where to get charts and, and what this means. I'm, I'm basing the next few comments on the type of what we called in, in medicine charts. When we talk about charts, we're talking about the thing that's really current that we're working with um, at, the, at the doctor's station where we're writing notes or checking orders or writing orders. But in fact, it's kind of synonymous with your medical records. So whether you call it your chart or your medical records, they're really synonymous. The point I want to make again is your medical record is scattered everywhere. It's not collated in one place. And it's really up to you to try to pull it all together. So typically in medical records, they'll include demographic information. This is you know where you live, what your number is, phone number, social security, all of that. Um, this can be duplicated. It's probably a good thing to have a demographic pa page in your own chart. Um, whether or not you include a social security number, I think it really depends on your level of comfort with this. I mean, in the days of, uh, we have to be very careful about um, this type of sensitive information being stolen. <coughs> um, the next thing would be advanced directives. Again, um, this is important, but remember the advanced directives that exist are pretty boilerplate and they really don't describe what you as an individual really wants. You know, do you want to be put in a back room and have, you know, hula dancers and a lot of Hawaiian music and, you know, go out pleasantly? Or do you want to, you know, be put through 10 operations and enrich the hospital and, and die anyway? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of sounds absurd, but there are lots of choices, and I think it's up to us as individuals to kind of reflect on what you want in your final moments. Even if it isn't your final moments, you're already at risk. You've got a lot of health problems. And you, you, you might say, I'd just rather be conservative most of the time unless I absolutely have to. But putting these ideas down on paper is really good, and unfortunately, the boilerplate um, style doesn't let you do that. Oh, Judy. Two things on that. One is I would suggest the five wishes. Two is uh, talk to your family, uh, especially your kids, about this. Because mm -hmm. at least in some states where I practice, your uh, living will is isn't worth the paper it's written on because your family can overrule anything, or as they say in some hospitals, uh, the patient isn't. Mm hmm oh. Yeah. That's but, reality. I'm just warning you. No, but I think the more specific you are and the more this is a firm document, I think that you would be in a better position. I think, unfortunately, that you're right, but you're dealing again with strangers. If you come to a small hospital, which is what we had, you don't have to go over a lot of these things. And that's another one of the tragedies of medical um, facilities being bigger and less personal. Any other comments on that? 
So the history in physical is kind of the traditional go-to place when you want to find out, um, you know, what happened when you first came in. So let's say that um, you have a bleeding ulcer and you go down to Maine Medical. Um, when you get there, you'll be in the emergency room, there'll be records there, but, um, and that becomes part of your current record. But you're going to be assessed by an intern or resident. Um, they're going to uh, put this, collect this data, and they're going to um, do, um, base it on what's called a chief complaint. And this is something that's very important uh, for a couple of reasons. What you say at the entrance to any medical encounter will have great bearing on what happens for the rest of the time particularly if those who follow don't carefully listen, don't carefully question. So, for instance, if somebody comes in the emergency room, um, I would be faced with, I just don't feel well. So it's vague and you have to dig down and so forth. But somebody else might come in and say, I got a kidney stone. And you say, well, what is that? I mean, why do you think it's a kidney stone? Well, I got back pain. And where's your back pain? Well, it's down here. And I look at them and I think, no, it's probably a ruptured aneurysm. But if you just take what's said at face value, you have to be very, very careful. And unfortunately, what, what sets the tone for the rest of the hospital stay begins with this ch chief complaint. And the next thing is the history. These go hand in hand. When you go to a physician at anywhere or a nurse practitioner or any health care provider, be very specific about what you are feeling for a symptom, why you're concerned about it, how long it's been going on, what you've done to relieve it. Has it ever been there before? Really flesh this whole thing out. And the most important thing I think of that is why you're concerned of it. Because if I never asked the person why they were concerned about the pain, I might go down, I might suppose that they wanted pain relief and all of this. And I'd start down this cascade of treatments and tests and so forth. But if I stop to ask them why they're concerned, they might say, well, my grandmother died of cancer and that's what I'm worried about. And that is a real concern. And if you don't address their concerns, you haven't helped them. Turn it around. If your concern is that you've got a terminal illness and you can't put your finger on it, don't make up a symptom to justify why you're there. Tell that person that you have this sixth sense feeling, that you're, you have this doomsday feeling, you have something that's really wrong. And if you put it that way, I'll bet you'll get a lot more attention. And at least it will be directed, hopefully, at what the, the problem may be. Patients know their bodies. I mean, uh, it's no news to all of you, but a lot of physicians are just coming around to that. So anyway, the, to go on, uh, there's a lot of data here, but I'm just trying to hit the high points. The, the history is really important for the physician to say, okay, this person's had belly pain for three days. They've been throwing up. They've had no bowel movement. They've had previous surgery. Their belly's distended. For me, that's a no-brainer. That's a small bowel obstruction until till I consider otherwise. Just that amount of information really helps me if I'm a consultant. And I go in and verify that, examine the patient, and so forth. But there aren't, things aren't always that clear, as you know. Sometimes things are very vague, and sometimes there's been a constellation of symptoms. Maybe they haven't all happened at the same time. The reason that it's important to think about all of these things that come together, you sh if you can, put some time and effort into summarizing this so you can be your own advocate, and you can say, Doc, I've had three things happening. I don't know whether they're connected or whether they're not, but this is what's been going on. They all occurred at the same time, and I've had a headache, I've had a fever, I've had a skin rash, and um, oh, by the way, a tick bit me. Well, that's helpful, but sometimes, 
sometimes it's not that clear and all of these things could be separate issues but maybe they hang together. So what I'm saying is the history is really important to try to pull all of those together. Um, so the physical exam, you've all been through that and those are important. Unfortunately, the way physicians are reimbursed, hospitals are reimbursed, you, the more data you put down, the more you can charge. And you can see the, the, the lure there is to document things that maybe you didn't document as well. I mean, it really tests for as well. You think the belly was okay, and it looked okay, but you didn't really touch it in great detail. And I can tell you as a former surgeon, there's a lot of information you can get with a belly exam. And if that's just kind of brushed over, things could be missed. So that's something you may want to pay attention to if you're reviewing your old records. You know, you get a sense of how complete things were. Um, so basically, you would just go on to, to Section 8. I, I think time's getting late. I'd rather open it up to discussion. What I put here is a number of things that I think are really important for you to include the sections in your medical record under the demographics. I just put a few that would be significant. You can put down all the things that you think are relevant. Your power of attorney, medical power of attorney, your pastor's name, your priest's name, um, your, your um, you know, all of the significant numbers of your children, whatever you think is important. Um, advanced directives, again, be really specific about what you want. And, you know, saying something like, well, if I don't have a prayer's chance in hell and, I, you know, I'm 300 years old, you know, just let me go. Well, yeah, that makes sense. But what about if you're only 56 and you lead a miserable life and you're tired of being in the hospital? Somebody might look at you and come to a different conclusion and say, you know, I think you're awfully young to die, you know. And, you know, caregivers by nature want to help you. And unless you really ple make a strong case for yourself about why you do or do not want things, then it's, it's going to be, uh, I think, problematic. Physicians can say, I talked to this patient about having a life-saving operation, but they refused because of X, Y, or Z. And if they're specific, they're covered. It puts them in a position of comfort. They can treat you like a human being then but you have to you know, be as specific as you can. And you have to be willing to talk about it too, as Judy suggested, with your family. You have to be very clear with them. So, um, <clears throat> the um, other things I think are pretty self-apparent. Uh, I think the medication list is really important. Get to know them well. The one. Uh, some additional detail here on this. Uh, oftentimes I would see somebody's got a, they're on aspirin every day. What does aspirin mean? What dose? How many a time, a, a d times a day do you take it? Is it 81 milligrams? Are you taking two tablets? Is it a hypertension pill that you use, uh, so they'll say um, antihypertensive pill, 150 milligrams, but they take two twice a day. Showing the strength isn't enough. You need to know what the total dose is, but it's really helpful to know what the strength of the tablet is because if you're leaving a medical encounter and you're told to cut your pills in half, you'll know that has to be defined by the person looking at the dose and say, okay, it's going to be appropriate for you to have 75 milligrams twice a day. You're already taking 150 milligrams twice a day. It just simplifies and makes safer a very, what should be a very simple process. So, um, and now, any questions on this? Because I want to spend a few minutes um, about the, um, the study group and try to enlist uh, some interest if anybody's interested and to get some feedback about how we might if you don't want to join the study group, how you might benefit from this and in what format. So any questions about the medical record at this point? Yes? On the chronological list, mm -hmm. should that be from most recent back? I think so, yes, yes. 
it makes sense to me to do it that way. Yeah. Yes. I understand you're supposed to have your um, advanced directives mm -hmm. at the hospital, at the doctor, you have to have them in two or three places. If you go in there without the hard copy, they can't do it, right? They can't. That's like th that's kind of like the question Jerry was answered. Is there a standard approach at each hospital? I would say that you're best off keeping your hard copy, if you will, with you. And when you go to the hospital, when you go to the doctor's office, if you've revised it, make sure they get a copy. Um, take it to parties. You know, you just never know when it's going to become necessary. So, so take it to church. You know that. <laughs> you also have to have it if you're going on an ambulance because they, uh, whether you say at the hospital you don't want to be revived, they have to. If you're in the ambulance, they if have they to. picked you, you might be right in certain instances. Let me just clarify that. Um, if a person is leaving the urgent care and the physician has filled out the EMTALA form, which gives specific instructions of, for the ambulance people of what to do and you are a DNR, that person is supposed to list on that transfer sheet that you are a do not resuscitate. But if they pick you up at your house and you don't have that in your hand, they have to resuscitate. What they can do, if you can tell them, if you're awake and, you're, and things aren't looking good, you can say, I'm a DNR and you could have a medical alert bracelet I remember one lady had it tattooed on her chest. <laughs> and I said, what if somebody doesn't undress you to do the resuscitation? She said, oh, that's their loss, you know. <laughs> um, the, but if, if an ambulance person picks you up, they may call in to medic control, medical control in the local hospital and get a verbal thing based on their conversation. Increasingly, there was an experiment, I don't know how it's worked out since, where the local ambulance had an iPad and a, and a, and a camera and they could, um, the medical control person could, could do FaceTime with it and talk to the ambulance crew and it'd be better communication. I think that's a great idea. But, I mean, you bring up something for which I don't think there's, that, that it's going to be a perfect answer all the time, regrettably. Well, you or Patty gave us a little uh, kit that goes on your refrigerator. Yes. That you can grab, or the, or the ambulance people can look for. Yes. It, and it should say what your wishes are. And, and by the way, this is what I would hope with your own medical record. You keep it somewhere that becomes a standard location in this community. So the ambulance, this is Patty's idea, ambulance could, people would know where to grab it and take it. So... There's another question? You had a question? Oh, no, I was thinking people have it on their refrigerator with the list of their meds and everything. Yeah, right. Okay, what I want to do, um, well, in thinking over, I'm going to give you some of my thought process, scary as it is. Um, when I thought about how to approach this, I got thinking, I like to teach I'm not a teacher. I do well one-on-one -on -one with specifics. I had a patient come in, they've got a specific question, I have a certain amount of objective data on them. I can be fairly good about trying to answer that person's question. But turn this around when we're looking at the big picture of medical health for a given individual and it changes so much from person to person. How do you go about this? Well, I have some experience in it. And, and yet I recognize things are going to change. And just like medical knowledge itself, there's so much data out there. There's so many things changing. New websites, new formats, new software programs. I thought, doesn't it make sense to start off by, uh, with a study group where we have a certain small number of people, a manageable in other words, so we can all talk and get information from one another. I'll present a little bit of didactic information each time. We'll have recorders that will jot down questions that come up. There'll be homework assignments on 
go out and find the best website for dealing with Crohn's disease, say. You know, somebody says, I've got Crohn's disease, so we'll direct them there. What I would hope eventually is that we develop a system where ordinary people develop the ability to assess and judge the quality of various websites. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, particularly if we're doing it together. We can look for joint studies, you know, really big studies that have a lot of power, i.e., they've looked at a condition with so many patients, this information is really compelling. Um, we'll learn how to generate our own medical records. And so by doing this, I wanted to study how people go about this so I can learn, can learn for myself, can learn for subsequent study groups, learn for the system. And the information we gather hopefully will increase and increase and we'll have a compilation of, of um, clinical information that can be really helpful. At the same time, we're gonna have to keep coming back to groups like this and say, what's really important? Is this making sense? Is this helpful? What ideas do you have? So that in kind of a nutshell is what I wanted to do. One other thing is I, um, in this last Tuesday when I spoke at the um, annual meeting at um, the uh, Booth Bay town office, uh, I handed out kind of a synopsis of what I wanted but I want to tell you that I'm not rigid about any of this. I want to start off in a certain direction. I want to see how it's going. I want to gain ideas from other people and then just keep refining this. And so it's, the whole process is meant to teach people exactly what I want them to learn, which is to be self-motivated, self-directed, and believe in their abilities to gain and understand information. So hopefully it will work. Bill. Yeah. Well, I think you know. I think that's. I think it's. A, I think it's a really good information. What What I kind of thought about tonight, and and Patty and I discussed this. So to make it not too daunting, we thought, okay, let's let's try to do two or three sessions a month. Uh, and originally, I was thinking about one session a week, and would try to confine it to an hour more or less, and um, a lot of work would be done at home and as much or as little as you want to do, but you know, that's up to the individuals. Um, but definitely pushing people toward their computers, toward the library, magazines, newspapers, whatever you want, and then try to bring this information back to the meeting. So, Again, I was going to let it run for a four-week cycle or four meetings. Patty and I uh, would sit down with the group and say, how's it going? Are we spinning our wheels? Are we gaining? What ideas should we change the format? If, if there were too many people for one study group, we thought about dividing it so you have like multiple small groups within the study group. Everybody hears the same lecture for 15 minutes, you break into small sec sections so you can discuss things, and then you come back and have a joint meeting. Or we could bring to a group like this the things that we're finding, try to make it an efficient slide-driven program that's meaningful, and um, as opposed to just paper, and, and really try to, to help you with this whole process for those that are, of you that are interested. At the same time at the end of the meetings, it would be a great opportunity for information to come back to us from a different group. What's interesting to you? What's informative? What have you heard? What are the problems that you're having struggling with your own medical records? Or, you know, do we want to have, you know, a series of uh, speakers on this, you know? Whatever feedback we get is going to be helpful. Any comment, Patty, on? No, I'm, I'm curious to know what I mean, we were thinking about um, staying, staying <coughs> on Tuesday evenings, but we don't know whether that's 
going to be good. And we know they're available at the library, but we don't know if that's going to be good for you know most people. And um, Steve's going to be away for a couple of weeks, so we'll definitely be skipping. You know, won't be every every single week. Um, and I had uh, we had some people. We've got about ten people who've already signed up. Mm -hmm. I have a <coughs> pad you can sign up on if you are interested in um, joining. <coughs> um, I think maybe we need to have a little bit more discussion from people about what their constraints might be or what would make it work for you. Definitely. Right. I mean, because the fact that I'm no longer working or is working as much as I did, I certainly could entertain, you know, teaching sessions during the morning, the afternoon. It doesn't have to be the evening. Um, during the middle of the night might not be practical, but, <laughs> but, but anyway. And, and definitely during the week. I don't think anybody wants to entertain weekends, but uh, so... So would you Bill. be directing, you passed out last week and then again tonight, this patient. I passed out last week? That's private information, <laughs> no, Bill. You shouldn't you share the, oh, the, that I distributed. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> distributed last week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll move it to the I'm a very literal person, if you didn't, you know. That's for sure. <laughs> um, this list of patient empowerment studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me let me go back to that bill. I've got that somewhere, so let me just dig it out. And I think it's, it, has, it was distributed again tonight. Yes. It'll just take me a minute. Okay, yes, got it. Go ahead. And you have six goals there. Are you going to those or prioritize, which isn't quite the first, but are you going to establish a priority for these? About these, good question. Um, I can think of many more things that we could entertain and study in the group. So what I thought I would do is come out with what I think are the greatest priority for the first couple weeks. Get feedback from the group, and then it has to be, you know, something where people are telling me, this, we've got this, you're just beating a dead horse, as somebody in the back room said. By the way, my, my, one of my sons, when he was eight years old, I used to love to take my boys places, and when I had them in the car, I knew that I could pontificate, something I really enjoyed doing. <laughs> And, and, but I didn't have a lot of time with them, and I didn't have a lot of quality time. And one of the things I would do when we were driving somewhere, I was always asking them questions, always telling them things and talking and so forth. And one of my kids, Mac, used to like out, look out the window and you know, kind of shrug. I couldn't see this. This is the kind of body language I was told about later. But I remember going on and on and on and on. <laughs> And finally, he stood up behind me and said, Dad, I get your point, and I've heard about enough. So at some point, I'm going to get that message that I've spoken enough, and the rest will be decided by you know, the members of the group. I, I think it's a, it's, a moving, it's a moving target. Who knows what will come out of this? Maybe we'll get sidetracked from something really fascinating that's happening very quickly, and we all want to be kind of on top of it and, you know, yes? One final point is, is I think in that list, I would recommend two, I have number two, which is a statement member about how to collect, understand, correct, and maintain the medical records. Th that, I, unfortunately, first, no, no, no question about that. I, I, and you could possibly build from there and mm -hmm. what people are looking for. But I think that's, you know, I mean, I'm, in, I'm interested because, in my mind, patient empowerment is by far best. You know, and, and I've not been received badly because of patient empowerment. You know, they're, they're pleased to hear that I know something about what's going on in my hmm. informant because we can get started. I think that and I think you made a very extremely important point is as a, uh, this 
someone, a recipient of health care, is that we would be better off not walking in and saying, I have a kidney stone, but walking in and saying, these are the physical symptoms I'm experiencing. And then from there, it sounds like you can put together, well, maybe that's a kidney stone, so I should ask X, Y, Z, or maybe it's something else, and I can ask right. Z. You know, it, it seems to me that that is at least what would be this whole concept of giving people in power. Um, there's a tremendous amount of information out there. I mean, if you have kidney problems, you can Google kidney and come up with an extremely long list of, of things to go through. Right. Um, you know, a very simple thing that I always use as a rule is I will not look at anything that doesn't say .org or .something to indicate that it is in somewhat non-biased. You know, and I ignore anything that says .com because it must tell me something. Yeah. And I was also going to say, by the way, earlier, Microsoft offers a program called Health Vault. I'm sorry, say that again? Health Microsoft Vault? Microsoft offers a program called Health Vault. That's interesting to know. And it is free. And, and the downside is that you'll have to enter all the records into it. Mm -hmm. It is a system. I think Apple has one too, but I'm not sure it's where Apple is. But is that an Apple a day keeps the doctor away, or is it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. And you won't have money to go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. What? Is I think you, I think you I think it's important to be critical of all I mean analytical, not necessarily well, critical is good. But what I'm saying is you have to develop a habit of saying, okay, so this is true. How, how much is this true? You know, this is a total shift away from you're going to believe everything your doctor says. That's going to, that's going to be heretical after a while. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. She, she asked first, so. I would just like to um, echo that I think number two is really important and probably should be the first thing that anybody goes after, but there are no action steps on how to accomplish that. We've talked about a lot of ideas tonight, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard of anybody who's had any good experience, experiences or bad experiences with my chart. Oh, that's good. Does that have good eyes? Oh, mine's real good. But now Connie, she has a, she's got a problem because her doctor doesn't give her any of the summary or anything else. But when I, when I get mine from South Carolina, I bring it up here and they put it on. Because the problem is, is you got South Carolina, you got Maine. Instead of if you put it all on one, then you don't have to do it both ways. And this is the one that's through the hospital. What can you tell me Right. So what they do is, is in South Carolina, they, I bring the record up here and they put it in the main. Have we? Yeah, I think that that's the type of thing I'd like to hear about. And, you know, anybody who has suggestions, like Bill said, of, of the Microsoft product or any product, I think we should, you know, be feeding this stuff to each other. And and again, um, I by by starting with the health record in paper form, you could go in a lot of different directions as far as electronics go, but. Um, you know, and I also appreciate, when I made that list, I was just thinking out loud, you know, what are the things, kind of things I want to uh, do. I, it isn't necessarily a priority. The focus of that stay, study group, the purpose is to teach people how to keep their medical records, but from this, a lot's going to happen, I think. Yes, Jerry? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, I don't think we, we want to get so focused on the medical record. That's the first step, but the ultimate goal here is to use the medical record and the information and the understanding of my medical record that makes me feel confident in asking the right questions, intelligent questions, collecting the right information, and you know that whole empowerment. The medical yeah. record piece is that's only the first step. Right. Exactly. I think that's very true, and I think that one of the things that I mentioned, in, uh, in, and again, this is not a, an exhaustive list of suggestions for your own medical record, but um, 
in medical charts in the hospital, there's a session, a section called progress uh, notes, and somebody may not may actually regress instead of progress, but they're always called progress notes. That's a bit optimistic, perhaps. But physicians will talk about what the current state of the patient is, vital signs, what the treatment's been, any problems incurred. It's kind of a, an update of what's going on day to day or sometimes several times a day if that person's in the intensive care unit. You could do the same thing. Let's say you have um, a new symptom you've never had before, headaches or back pain, whatever. You start keeping a diary, something somebody mentioned over here. I think it's a good term because start putting down your symptoms. Give the chronology of it, what makes a difference, what makes it worse, what you're thinking it might be, express your concerns about it. Mention the family history, somebody might have had a brain aneurysm um, or 99 people in your family did. You know, all of these could be significant. Um, but then you want to kind of track what's been done, what your doctor told you to do, what the test has been. It's your own medical records. And it's, and it's very, it's going to be, I think, very accurate compared to any other medical records. And if you took it to a neurologist, say, three months down the line, and you showed them a three-day, a three-page report of what the chronology has been, You've helped that person usually in trying to, re, to, in trying to come to a diagnosis. So I, it, it makes sense. It can be tedious, but it can be very effective. I'm not talking about the kind of Facebook things people, you know, had tuna fish today, went to the market, you know, that sort of thing, obviously. But too much data is, is not good, but I think really significant data is helpful. Yes? I just also, for those of you who are electronic people, um, we will have kind of a parallel process for those of us who are interested um, as we're doing all the paper records and understanding how to keep our medical records and what should be in them and how to talk to our doctors. Um, we will have kind of a side thing of looking at all the electronic stuff that's available and trying to figure out which one or two or three of them we might recommend to people and try them out ourselves and see what works with the idea that maybe eventually we'll all kind of end up using one or two or three of these things and we can have the physical book and we can have it all electronic and digital and take it with us wherever we go. Um, so there's, a, there's another, there's a halfway thing too and that is you and I like um, Apple, I guess Bill you're a PC person maybe. So I'm learning to use pages. I haven't done a whole lot of writing in the last few years, except I like, actually, I like sitting down with a tablet and writing with a pen. But that's not really efficient, and, and I scatter it everywhere. So I'm, I'm starting to confine my attempts to the pages, and then I can go back and modify it or add to it. But you can always print it off and put it in your three-ring binder. It doesn't ha it, just because it's paper doesn't mean it isn't computer generated. You can use any um, lots of software for tracking uh, data. You know, so I think it's you know push your, push yourself a little bit. You know, there is no limit to how far you can go. And certainly, Patty has promised that there will be this significant arm of this process where people can gain abilities at the computer or be helped with a computer when that's necessary. So the message is nobody should be excluded because of technology. Are you really putting out information on your website, Booth Bay Wellness Org? Yeah. That, that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, We'll have a section on it um, for this patient empowerment program, so all of the notes and all of the, the link to the video and all of the resources we come up with. And also the library is um, working with us to, um, as we identify um, you know, medical sites that we think are really useful, they're gonna go up on a site, on the library site as well. I was thinking that several different kinds of my record forms yeah. that you can put them up there and have people decide what they like. You know? right. I, think that's an, I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. 
And hopefully in this process, we're going to work that through so we have considered enough things. I, I would love to hear input what you all think is, would be helpful. And then we can work on that in the study group, kind of tweak that, if you will, and then come up with a format that we can distribute. People can work with it and say, gee, did you think about this? It would really be nice if we added this. That's the kind of synergy I've been you know, trying to address here. And I think it can really work. And I think it, um, you know, I would suggest that maybe any of you who's interested, we come back again, say, in two months or three months, and we revisit this. Those of you that don't want to be part of a study group will hear a, an update on how we're doing. We'll get feedback from you. And um, as well as posting on the, on the website pertinent references, um, I guess some of the lectures are going to be posted. Uh, we're hoping to have generate some videos uh, eventually. I mean, there, it's mind-boggling what's available to us to do. We just have to find the time and a little bit of some resources and, and the expertise to kind of put these together. I mean, I think if you look around the room, there's probably individuals. Each of us has some expertise that together we can do a lot more. It would be it would be wonderful if we could uh, look to that future and had a place that we could call our own for administrative, for meetings, for teaching. Ira had a great suggestion that we have a place for people to gather to just to swap information. You know, like vets, wasn't it? Was, remember that you brought up that at one of the meetings. I think that you know there's there's lots of things that depending on the individual and how they like to receive information, how they want to interact with other people can vary. I think that we've got to be very mindful that in, if we want to hit people, you know, hit the whole population, we're going to have to come from a variety of perspectives. So feedback is going to be very important for us to know whether we're hitting the mark, whether we can improve it, you know, whatever. Those of you who have family, young children and, and grandchildren, um, as you're learning to do this, keeping your medical records, um, if you would share that with the younger generation, I think it would be very important because a lot of us, I'm, sit, I'm sitting back listening to all of this and thinking about uh, when I was well, 40 years ago, the, the doctor who had seen me most of my life died, and I got a letter. As a result of that, do you think? <laughs> or, I, I didn't know where you were going with that. You got to watch yeah. it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I received a letter from uh, a law firm representing his widow, and I was told that if I wanted my records, I had to come up with something. With it. it was like... $75 or something. In those days, it was a huge chunk of change. And that if they didn't hear from me in a certain amount of time, those records would be destroyed. And I called them and I said, you can't do that. And they said, yes, you can. Yes, we can. They belong to us. They don't belong to you. So I That's have no access to any of that history. Um, so I think it's important that, that you know, there, we, when we meet like this, there are an awful lot of us who's, who have white hair in here. Mm -hmm. And I think we, part of our mission needs to be to get this good news to the younger generation in the community. Yeah, I think there's lots of things we need to address direct toward young kids. And, I, and mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a big conundrum. How do you reach them, you know? Well, the young parents, um, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's anyway. So, um, Steve, the next, we're, we're thinking that the next meeting for the study group would actually be next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Are there people who would like to And that join? would be here? And that would be here. Okay. So uh, the people who would like to join the study group for having 
Tuesday evenings is a terrible time. Only mm -hmm. well, one. <laughs> okay. What about, um, are there other, like Wednesday evening or other nights that are better for you? Yes, uh, Thursday. Okay. What about if I present a didactic session every time, would this be available to anybody who wants to, to see it in video form via the website link? Because that might be helpful to you. Would you be able to access that? On my computer? Yes. I don't have the brains to, con to connect to anything. I have a person that comes every Saturday and lectures me on what can be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I forget it the next day. Okay. So. Well, this is the type of thing we'd like to hear because we'd like to meet, you know, address, uh, help as many people as we can. Uh, you know, obviously there's a limit to the amount of time. So on the sign-up sheet, I'm putting down best day as another place you can you can list. In addition to putting your name email if you have it and phone number if you want to be a, be a part of the study group. As I said, we've already got about eight or ten people signed up. We want to find out who else would like to, and I'll just put this up here where Steve is so that as you're leaving you can Is it going to be like the want. second wave? Yeah, I would oh, hope yeah, so, we'll yes. We have multiple yeah. waves. Yeah, actually what I was thinking is if, if there are going to be people, I hope, who will come out of these study groups with so much ability that they can take on and be leaders themselves. They can help individuals in their homes, perhaps, um, in work sessions. You know, there, there's, you know, what I hope it's like, a, you know, a ripple in a pond. You throw a, a pebble in and the rings just spread. And that, you know, um, we organize this and you know, certainly I would like to stay involved with it at su in some way, but I also might want to start other study groups looking at different projects. So I just think it's a good way for us to kind of dig down and get the, get the type of detail and ideas and, um, and collaborative information that uh, could be really beneficial.